Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Today's show is a listener request. It is from Katie from quite a while back. So my apologies that it takes so long. But as you guys know, our list is a mile long. Uh, And this particular show is about a woman who was born into England's aristocracy in the 19th century and whose work breeding horses has had an impact that is still felt today. And this is part one of two. This is also an example of not a sad royal childhood, but a sad aristocratic childhood and adulthood. It serves, at least for me, as one of those great reminders that even people who seem to live a charmed life and have the ultimate in privilege uh, are often dealing with plenty of their own problems. So also a heads up if you are listening with younger history buffs, there is a lot of talk of adultery in both of these episodes. So be prepared. Uh, We are going to talk today about a woman who came to be known as the Lady of Horses, Lady Anne Blunt. She was born September 22nd, 1837, In anything but humble beginnings, her parents were Lord and Lady King, the Earl and Countess of Lovelace. Her mother, you would know more commonly as Ada Lovelace, the daughter of George Gordon, Lord Byron. Lady Anne, the granddaughter of Lord Byron, was born Lady Anne Isabella Noel King, was called Annabella as a child. She later chose to go by Anne. And if you listen to the episode in our archive that Katie and Sarah did about Ada Lovelace, you know that she continued to study numbers and her scientific interests after her children were born. And both Ada and her husband, William King, wanted Anne to be more than an idle woman of privilege and to be a thinker. Ada Lovelace's mother, Lady Byron, who had been married to Lord Byron, was deeply involved in the household and had a significant voice in Anne's upbringing. But although she had these three adults who all had distinct hopes for her, In reality, Anne was being raised by governesses and nannies more than her parents or her grandmother. It does seem like Lady Byron was deferred to on a lot of decisions regarding the children's upbringing, no doubt because she was also paying for most of the family's living expenses. Lady Byron, Anne's grandmother, made all the decisions regarding the tutors and the governesses and in selecting the guiding ideologies of how Anne and her brothers Byron and Ralph were going to be raised and educated. Biographer H.V.F. Winstone wrote of Lady Anne's childhood the following, quote, Anne, for her part, was destined hardly to know her obsessive mother or indeed her father. Her grandmother's power over her, however, was to prove almost absolute. As Ada Lovelace became consumed by both an ongoing illness and her obsession with her work, her involvement with her children continued to wane. She called her daughter and her sons Lady Byron's grandchildren rather than talking about them as her own children. And she once wrote of motherhood, quote, unfortunately every year adds to my utter want of pleasure in my children. They are to me irksome duties and nothing more. Poor things, I am sorry for them. They will at least find me a harmless and inoffensive parent, if nothing more. Yeah, the story of Ada Lovelace in her later years, this is quite sad. And she, of course, develops a gambling problem and some other issues of impulse control and her illness takes its toll on her. So in some ways, probably quite good. She was not around her kids that much. Uh, But there was still a very real absence that was felt. And Anne began keeping a journal when she was 10. That was something she continued to do for the rest of her life, although there are some gaps here and there. And there are also some instances during particularly painful periods where the pages of her diary were torn out. From a very early age, Anne was drawn to nature. Plants and animals held just an endless fascination for her. She took lessons in singing, art, German, French, and playing a variety of musical instruments. Her artistic talents were cultivated to the point where she became very good at both drawing and painting. She studied with John Ruskin, who became one of the Victorian art scene's most influential critics, and she did that at the arrangement of her grandmother. While he's often cited as her art teacher, though, a much greater influence on her was engraver Tom Boyes, who filled in for Ruskin while he was too busy to see to his students. Once she started to receive instruction from boys, Anne's drawings and watercolors became a lot more numerous and a lot more accomplished. When Lady Anne was 15, her mother, Ada Lovelace, died of uterine cancer. And at this point, her father became more involved in Anne's life. Lovelace's relationship with Lady Byron, who he had originally been quite close with, uh, I think 
in the that previous episode from the archive, they actually joke about how he just seemed to love his mother-in-law and they had like this great relationship, but it did not last. Uh, that relationship deteriorated in those years leading up to Ada's death. And after she died, he began hiring governesses and tutors to look after Anne on his own without Lady Byron's input. Anne's father did reach out to Lady Byron on numerous occasions to try to smooth things over a little, but the tensions between them remained. Anne corresponded regularly with her grandmother and was sometimes caught in the middle of these two adults as Lady Byron sent her advice that was intended to continue her upbringing in the way she would have managed if she were still in charge and encouraged the teenaged Anne to manipulate her father. And to be fair, she was trying to manipulate, (laughs) she was trying to get Anne to manipulate her father to do the sorts of things that she thought were best for her upbringing. She was not trying to get her to manipulate her father to, like, buy her extravagant clothes. (laughs) No, not at all. It was definitely all about, like, what she thought was correct in her education and her, um, you know, social activities and those kinds of things. And to that end, in 1854, Anne and her father took a trip together, visiting Switzerland and Italy and meeting up with family friends and occasionally her brothers along the way. And this trip was something that Lady Byron had desperately wanted. Anne was going to see great artwork and hear the finest music and study along the way and learn about the world, and all of that was endorsed by and encouraged by her grandmother. And after the journey was over, Anne actually went to stay with Lady Byron in Cavendish Square. Lady Byron's influence definitely colored Anne's perceptions of her father, at least for a time. At the age of 18, Lady Anne wrote the following poem after an afternoon spent with her father. Yesterday, for three hours, I was walked of every pleasure balked. I thought, Papa, you did not want me. You ought, my dear, on such occasion to inquire. You might more eagerness have shown me norals to see and to admire. And we're going to talk about how Lady Anne's view of her father shifted a little bit after Lady Byron died. But first, we are going to have a quick sponsor break. As the 1850s wore on, Lady Byron, who was elderly at this point, became quite ill and she was unable to do a whole lot. And so at the same time, relatives saw to it that Anne was kept very busy socially. She was much in demand as a young, eligible woman from such a noteworthy family. But Anne stayed really devoted to her grandmother, and when Lady Byron died in May of 1860, it was Anne who wrote all of the letters notifying lawyers and relatives and friends of her passing. Eventually, Anne seems to want to adopt the very best views of the people in her life, in spite of all the squabbles that they had with one another. She wrote to a friend several years after Lady Byron died that she felt like she needed to defend her, but also that she felt like her family matriarch had been wrong in her opinion of Anne's father, that she wanted to believe the things that her father told her about her mother. Anne had a sense that there was a lot of unknown history and hurt among the three of them, but she also believed that the mystery she was living with over all of this was a lot more painful than if she had just known the whole truth. Yeah, her brothers had a variety of issues as well, and she kind of framed it as though, like, hey, I bet if all of our weird family secrets were out, none of us would have the hang-ups that we have. Um, And one of the other things that happened in the 1860s in Lady Anne's life was really interesting to me and actually has ongoing import and impact in the modern world. So Lady Anne was particularly adept at playing the violin. She studied with the bohemian violinist and composer Leopold Jansa, and it was with his urging that she made a significant investment. In 1865, she purchased a Stradivarius violin that had been made in 1721 and was refurbished by Jean-Baptiste Villon. That refurbishment was minor. It was very carefully executed. Viome had reset the neck and had been extremely meticulous to preserve the instrument in its very pristine state as closely as possible. This particular instrument has become known as the Lady Blunt Stradivarius, and today it's considered to be one of the best preserved and rarest instruments made by Antonio Stradivari in part because it's been played very little and looks as it did the day that it was completed. It's changed hands many times, and in 2011, it was sold at auction by the Nippon Music Foundation with the proceeds from this record-breaking $15.9 million sale going to the relief efforts for the victims of the tsunami and earthquake that hit Japan that year. 
Yeah, there are some interesting videos online around like when the auction was about to happen and listening to people wax rhapsodic about this instrument is really, really fascinating and quite poetic because they clearly have such an appreciation for it as a piece of art. And it's uh, pretty cool. If you're interested, go look at it. Uh, Next, we're going to get to the significant person that shaped the course of Lady Anne's life for a long time. Lady Anne met Wilfred Scawin Blunt in 1866. And Wilfred uh, had been born on August 17th, 1840. So he was 26 at the time. She was a little into her 30s. He was working in a foreign office job to make ends meet. And he had joined the diplomatic service when he was 18. And just eight years in, he was already really tired of holding down a job. Blunt was a rake. He was a bit politically rebellious in that he was anti-imperialist. He was also pursued for his good looks. He had a lot of women who were attracted to him. It's somewhat surprising that Anne didn't meet him earlier because they had all these connections through family friends, but they actually met in Italy in spite of all of their overlapping social lives in England. Olympia Usedom, the daughter of Sir John Malcolm, introduced Anne and Wilfred, and this was not by chance. Olympia had told Blunt that she was going to find him a wealthy wife so that he could escape his daily toil, get some real stability. And Lady Anne was wealthy. She was interesting. She was educated in art and music. She had also uh, aged to the point that it was a little weird that she had not married yet. But Blunt was also involved to various degrees with an assortment of other European socialites at the time, some of whom were married. And while he did seem to enjoy meeting Anne, it wasn't really fireworks. While preparing for a trip to Argentina the following year, Blunt probably hoping to just provide for his own future, wrote Anne a letter claiming that he had considered proposing to her in Italy and that he regretted. He had regretted not doing that ever since it happened. Anne was not exactly taken in by this and replied that she might be too, quote, doubting and hesitating in her nature to be a good match for him. And while Wilfred was still traveling in the winter of 1868, his brother Francis and his sister Alice spent Christmas with Anne in northern Italy. And Francis and Alice really loved Anne. They were so excited at the prospect that maybe she might become part of their family. And meanwhile, almost all of Wilfred's friends and even his paramours encouraged him strongly to pursue this marriage with Lady Anne because it was going to be for his own good. When he and Anne finally met up in England again in the spring of 1869, she finally agreed to his proposal, and their marriage took place on June 8th of 1869. One of Blunt's lovers, Ella Baird, spent the whole ceremony crying. In marrying Anne, Wilfred had secured his fortune. He had married a very wealthy woman. And entering into this marriage also increased the annual allowance that he received through an inheritance of his own, more than fourfold, So by getting married, that inheritance that he already had went from 700 pounds to 3,000 pounds a year. Yeah, there are lots of stories of uh, inheritances that are predicated on those kinds of rules. Like, oh, as long as you're still a single cad, you can only have this. But if you settle down, you're going to need more for a family and a wife, so you'll get more money, which is why men like Wilfred are like, man, I got to find me a wife. (laughs) Uh, For her part, Lady Anne's own account of their courtship and their wedding was almost void of emotion or any sort of romantic embellishment when she wrote about it. She entered the details of their wedding day in her diary, but it is all very factual. It's about what times things happened, who their attendants were, and what time the post-ceremony breakfast ended. But there's definitely no swooning, there's no... Uh, sort of blushing bride excitement recorded in it, or even a description of her new husband. This could just be because Lady Anne was also dealing with a huge family scandal at the same time. Harriet Beecher Stowe's essay, Lady Byron Vindicated, was published just days before Anne and Wilfred were married. And in this essay, Stowe said that Lady Byron separated from her husband after he had an incestuous affair with his half-sister. Lady Anne was hounded by the press for some kind of statement on this matter. She wrote letters to the press recalling what she could from her youth, but ultimately she and Wilfred left for their honeymoon while reporters were still just after them for more information than she could possibly offer. On top of whether she could offer it, seriously, she just got married. Leave her alone. (laughs) Yeah, well, and it's one of those things where she never met Lord Byron. He was gone before she was born. 
And as we mentioned earlier, her family kept a lot of weird secrets and there were these weird, you know, sort of half histories that were shared and there was some distance from the children to begin with. So she was like, I don't know. My grandmother was very strict. Um, she didn't really have a lot that she could could offer. She just wanted to give the press whatever it took for them to leave her alone and quiet the story because it was, you know, a horrible incest scandal in the family of Lord Byron, who was a huge figure in England. It just was yuck. What a horrible thing to go through when you're trying to get married. Uh, but that marriage was also tainted from the beginning, unfortunately. So first by that scandal, which really kind of overshadowed the entire wedding, but then by several miscarriages, which Wilfred blamed entirely on Anne. It seemed as though they tried to have kids immediately. Um, and in the accounts of their travels on their honeymoon, which went on for a while, there were uh, kind of hints that something was going wrong, that she may be carrying a child and losing it. Uh, on several different occasions. And this, of course, led to strain and conflict between them. And soon, Wilfred just went ahead and started seeing other women, including his friend Ella Baird, that paramour who had cried through their whole wedding. In 1869, Wilfred was offered a job at the Foreign Office's St. Petersburg branch, and he turned it down and retired completely by the year's end. By the end of their first year together, Wilfred and Anne were spending periods of time apart, but they were splitting their time largely between England and France, just not usually on the same schedule and not usually in the same places. This was not something Anne was a fan of, but Wilfred liked having time away from his wife, presumably to pursue other women. And at the end of 1870, the Blunts, who had barely managed to escape the siege of Paris and make it back to England, had their first child. And it was a boy named Wilfred after his father, but the baby died just a few days later. And while Anne's account in her diary is similarly dispassionate to that of her wedding account, giving only the details and no indication of her grief, both she and her husband were really quite devastated. They continued to try to have another child, and after another miscarriage, they had the premature birth of twin girls who died shortly after they were born. In 1872, Wilfred and Lady Anne inherited a property in Sussex called Crabbit Park. And she turned the estate there into the home of a horse breeding farm and worked on refurbishing the Tudor house there. But Anne was soon pregnant again, and they returned to their home in London in the hopes that a quiet pregnancy, free of travel, might finally prove successful. We are about to talk about a change in fortunes for the Blunts, but first we'll have another quick word for a sponsor. On February 6th, 1873, Lady Anne gave birth to a daughter, Judith Ann Dorothea Blunt, who was one month premature. Judith was the only one of Anne and Wilfred's children to survive into adulthood. Wilfred was pretty open about his disappointment that they had not had a boy survive instead of a girl, but Anne was simply happy to have a healthy child at last. After Judith was born, the Blunts returned to their work at Crabbit Farm, and they started to focus on one of the things that did truly unite the two of them, and that was their desire to breed horses that incorporated Arabian bloodlines into English stock. In 1873, they traveled to Turkey, just the two of them, and they purchased the first of their acquisitions toward this goal, although that first horse was not a pure Arabian it was perhaps more like a honeymoon than their first honeymoon had been, and described herself on this trip as being almost too happy. But shortly after they returned to England, the magic was gone. Wilfred moved one of his paramours, Minnie Pollen, and her husband into one of the homes that he owned, and he set up an arrangement where she, Minnie, would care for Judith when he and Anne were traveling. He believed that neither Anne nor Minnie's husband were aware that he and Minnie had orchestrated this whole thing so that they could have easy access to one another. And this arrangement went on for 15 years. After Wilfred got himself into a series of problematic and scandalous tangles with other women, he swore off of his philandering and became more deeply religious. And he also became more serious about the horse breeding that he was doing with his wife. The Blunts started to brainstorm how they could bring some of the best Arabian horses they could find to England to breed at Crabbit Park. In 1877, the Blunts, both of whom were really interested in Arab culture as well as horses, 
began a tour of the Middle East. They traveled first to Beirut and then across Syria's northern region, and then they turned south to make their way to Baghdad via Mesopotamia. James Henry Skeeney, who was serving as the British consul in Aleppo, became a friend and mapped out a plan for the travels that the two of them were making in the region. Their desires for horses lined up really closely with those of Skeeney. And he also had the idea that strong Arabian stock should be shipped to England to invigorate the English thoroughbred bloodlines. And Lady Anne and Wilford Blunt, even though they had this person who lived and worked there, uh, were kind of ill-prepared for this whole enterprise initially. They spoke only the most rudimentary Arabic, just a few words here and there, and they did not really have an understanding of the very complex relationships and conflicts among the Bedouin tribes of the area. Lady Anne recognized the disadvantage that they had and She had also been given a book on horses that was written in Arabic, so she made a very serious effort to learn the language to the point of fluency. She also started forging relationships with the locals so that they wouldn't be regarded as just ignorant outsiders. Yeah, she was really, really good at forging relationships and basically, like, meeting a person and getting in good with him, and then he would say, like, hey, you know, there is another man that is, like, 300 miles away, but if you can get to where he is, he has some great horses, and tell him I sent you, and sort of forming these chain relationships uh, where she would say the right name to the right person and they would realize, like, oh, yes, you are someone we can trust. And her efforts really were rewarded. The Blunts, and specifically Lady Anne, came to be accepted and even trusted by the Bedouins that they visited and purchased horses from. There is even a story that there were some translation projects that she worked on with people while she traveled. And moreover... Anne found a very deep sense of happiness as they traveled through the desert. For one, she had surpassed the age at which her mother died, which she never expected to do. There is actually a story that when Ada Lovelace was on her deathbed, she said to her daughter, you will never live past 40, uh, which is a terrible thing to do. So Lady Anne was uh, quite surprised that she was in her 40s and in the desert having an absolute delight of a time searching for horses. Uh, But that was the other thing that really also gave her this sense of happiness. She felt as though she had found her true calling. They returned to England in May of 1878, and they waited for their new horses to arrive. In the meantime, Anne, at Wilfred's urging, compiled all of her notes and diaries into a book that was called The Bedouin Tribes of the Euphrates, which was published in 1879. Wilfred claimed partial authorship of this book, even though he really did not do a lot of the work. Yeah, there's a story in in the biography that I was reading that they're they're out traveling when this one publishes and someone says, oh, Anne, your book is, we saw your book in a bookstore and he's like, it's our book. <laughs> <laughs> he's sort of a jerk. Uh, almost as soon as those new horses arrived and were settled and the breeding program was really underway, Wilfred started to feel restless, so he and Anne planned to return to the desert, this time traveling more deeply into the central Arabian area that was known at the time as Nejd. They left in November 1879, and they were in Beirut by early December. The diaries of this second trip became the basis of Anne's second book, which was titled A Pilgrimage to Nejd which was published in 1881. Lady Anne was actually the first European woman on record that crossed the Northern Arabian Desert. That second trip was a lot more difficult than the first. This was partially because they were journeying into less traveled and more dangerous territory, but there were other problems as well. Violent storms slowed their progress into Persia, and when Wilfred got the idea that he would hunt boar, one of their intended targets became enraged, charged, and gravely injured one of the mares that they were traveling with. After they recovered from this whole incident and treated the horse, uh, Wilfred started having bouts of illness and eventually started having seizures. Yeah, Lady Anne's diaries at this point, like, she clearly was so upset by the whole thing where he was just sort of almost crazed about shooting things while they were traveling And she was yelling, like, hey, the mare is injured, and they were still just having to deal with this wild boar that was charging them, and it uh, definitely unsettled her nerves for a bit. Um, Wilfred, in the meantime, did recover enough that they were able to make their way to the summer capital of British India, which was Shimla, and they were met there by friends. And they actually stayed there for several weeks. It was pretty vacation-y at that point before they headed to Bombay, and then they made their way home in the last weeks of July. 
Both of the books that we mentioned are illustrated by Lady Anne herself. Her skills as a very speedy and precise sketch artist, which she honed in childhood, served her really well as a means to record their travels. She drew everything from landscapes of the areas that they traveled through to detailed diagrams of the horses that they looked at as possible stock. And while these detailed travel journals provide records of the Blunt's experiences and the horse stock that they were looking at, they were also invaluable in offering more information about Bedouin life than Europeans had ever known. Because of Anne's unprecedented relationships with the various tribes, she was able to include details about the religion and history of the people in the area, as well as how the various tribal groups interacted with one another. Her writing and sketches were so thorough that they were used by 20th century cartographers to create maps of the area with new details filled in. Illustrator Edward Stanford made a map in the late 1940s that showed Lady Anne's travel route, but also featured details like where Bedouin tribes set up camps for winter and what routes were being used during the Hajj to reach Mecca. The last months of 1879 were marked by a significant shift for both Anne and Wilfred. Anne, who had spent all of that time in the desert really reflecting on her life and doing a lot of soul-searching and deep thinking, decided that she was going to convert to Catholicism. And Wilfred went right back to the adulterous ways that he swore off before they started all of their travel in the Middle East. For Lady Anne, this really marks a turning point. Becoming a confirmed Catholic flew in the face of everything that her grandmother Lady Byron believed, so in her early 40s, Anne was just stepping into a new phase of her life. Yeah, to me, it's such a a moment where she casts off the expectations of her grandmother, who she really considered, even though she had been gone at that point for a while, and sort of makes a decision for herself that she knows would not have been in line with those desires and expectations. And that is actually where we're going to end this episode. Uh, The next one is going to delve into Lady Anne's ongoing work with horse breeding and, unfortunately, the ongoing drama that her husband brought into her life. Do you also have listener mail for us? I do, and it does not involve drama or horribleness at all, but something fabulous and art. Uh, This is from our listener, Vivian, and she writes, Dear Tracy and Holly, thank you for the terrific podcast. Uh, She recently went on a trip, and she listened to our podcast to help stay sane, in her words. And while she was traveling, she had the privilege of interning at the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. The museum holds thousands of artifacts from the late artist. Walter Anderson was an artist, writer, and philosopher who resided in Mississippi for his adult life. He was heavily influenced by nature, and he would spend months on Horn Island, a Gulf barrier island, drawing and painting his surroundings. Uh, She's suggesting him as a podcast topic. I'll put it on the list. Never know when we'll get there. But she also sent us a really lovely gift. Uh, She said, I've sent you guys reproductions of Walter Anderson's art, the Oakhead Cat. And the original was created in 1955, and these were created to commemorate the 90th anniversary of the founding of Shearwater Pottery, a ceramics company founded by Walter Anderson's brother, Peter. And they are absolutely lovely little cat sculptures. I'm holding one up, and I don't know if Tracy can see it or not. They're really cool. That's lovely. Um, And because I sure do love kitties, I love this, and it's going on my mantle with my other cat sculptures. Uh, Thank you so much, Vivian. I really appreciate it. It is such a delight. She uh, concluded her postcard by saying, I hope you enjoy the cats as much as I've enjoyed the show. I think that is a fair statement. I love them, and the postcard is a beautiful piece of art with colorful cats on it, uh, interspersed with a very beautiful black cat. Uh, So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I know Tracy does as well. So pretty. You would like to write to us? You can do so at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. You can also find us as Missed in History pretty much everywhere on social media. And MissedInHistory.com is our website where you can come and visit us, listen to every episode of the podcast that has ever existed, read show notes for any of the ones that Tracy and I have worked on, and just tootle around and explore history. So we hope you do at MissedInHistory.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 